Good evening aspirants welcome to Shankar summary 2024 in this video we are going to discuss important current affairs topics related to art and culture this will be useful for our 2024 prelims exam these are the topics we are going to discuss today now let us get into the discussion for the first topic we are going to discuss about geo heritage sites pandavla gutta in telangana and ramgarh crater in rajasthan have been officially designated as geo heritage sites now let us see some key facts about them Firstly about Pandavla Gutta it is located in Telangana and it dates back to Mesolithic period that is from 10000 BC to 8000 BC it contains rock shelters and habitation evidence from prehistoric times to medieval period it also has paleolithic cave paintings the cave paintings of bison antelope tiger and leopard can be found here it also includes shapes like swastika symbols circles and squares which are of in green red yellow and white pigments so this is about pandavla gutta in telangana next about ramgarh crater this crater is designated as geo heritage site by rajasthan government it is a meteor impact crater which is formed around 165 million years ago this crater is around 3 km in diameter it provides essential ecosystem services contributing to the region's ecological balance and biodiversity it is also recognized as ramgarh conservation reserve under wildlife protection act 1972 this crater has pushkar talab complex which is recognized as wetlands under wetland conservation and management rules 2017 there are distinctive rock formation fossils and landscapes which are important for education research and cultural significance So this is about Ramgarh crater. Now let us see some points about Geological Survey of India. Geological Survey of India was founded in 1851 and it was originally created to find coal deposits for railways. It is headquartered in Kolkata and it is an attached office to Ministry of Mines. The important functions are creating and updating national geoscientific information, assessing mineral resources, etc. In this context, we should also know about another important organization called Archaeological Survey of India. it comes under ministry of culture and it is leading organization for archaeological research and production of india's cultural heritage it was founded in 1861 by alexander cunningham he was the first director general of asi and he is also known as the father of indian archaeology so in this discussion we have seen some points about the newly declared geo heritage sites and about geological survey of india and archaeological survey of india with this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic Recently Kodi Kud in Kerala have been listed as UNESCO's Creative Cities Network. So in this discussion we will see about UNESCO Creative Cities Network. It was created in 2004 by UNESCO to bring together cities that value creativity as a way to develop their communities. It is a global network that includes around 350 cities from over 100 countries. Now what is the eligibility criteria to be included in this list? In order to be part of this network a city must meet certain criteria it should have strong cultural and creative industry presence a commitment to promoting cultural diversity and ability to leverage culture and creativity for sustainable development the entire network is organized into seven creative fields they were crafts and folk art media arts film design gastronomy literature and music so kolikud city which is recently added in the list comes under the category of literature this is because in kolikud several leading media houses are headquartered and it also has hundreds of publishing houses and several libraries so this is why it is chosen by unesco under its creative cities network already gwalior in madhya pradesh was added to this list under the category of music now what are the benefits if the cities are included in this unesco list first is international recognition being a part of unesco's network brings international recognition and prestige to the city then there will be cultural exchange cities can share and exchange knowledge experiences and best practices with other member cities then there will also be economic growth by boosting tourism it also helps in networking of cities cities can collaborate on projects and initiatives that promote their creative sectors and cultural heritage now let us see what are the cities included under creative cities network srinagar which is included under crafts and folk arts mumbai is included under the category of film Hyderabad under the category of gastronomy Chennai as a creative city of music Jaipur as a creative city of crafts and folk arts Varanasi as a creative city of music so these are the indian cities included in the creative cities network so with this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic see tamil nadu is planning to declare four new sites as biodiversity heritage sites aritapatti in madurai was the first biodiversity heritage site in tamil nadu 
So in this discussion, let us learn about biodiversity heritage sites. Already we have discussed about geo heritage sites. So don't confuse with that. Biodiversity heritage sites are well defined heritage areas with a unique ecologically fragile ecosystem. They can be terrestrial, coastal or inland waters or marine ecosystem. Know that under section 37 of Biological Diversity Act of 2002, the state government in consultation with the local bodies can notify a biodiversity heritage site. We should know that Nallu Tamarind Grove in Bengaluru, Karnataka was the first biodiversity heritage site of India. It was declared in 2007. At present, there are 44 such sites in India. So this is about the basics of biodiversity heritage sites. Now what are the characteristics of biodiversity heritage sites? They have species richness, high endemism, presence of rare and threatened species, keystone species, presence of wild ancestors of domestic species and also the areas with significant cultural or aesthetic values. So these are the characteristics of biodiversity heritage sites. Now let us see some points about Aritabatti Biodiversity Heritage Site. This is the first biodiversity heritage site of Tamil Nadu and it has rich biological and historical significance. Know that the site has a presence of around 250 bird species including three flagship raptor species. These three species are Lager Falcon, Shahin Falcon, Bonelli Eagle. Moreover, this site is surrounded by a chain of seven hills that serve as a watershed. It has 72 lakes and 200 natural springs and 3 check dams. Know that Anaikondan Lake which is built during Pandian Kings in 16th century is one among them. So this is about Aritapati Biodiversity Heritage Site. With this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. See Garba Dance of Gujarat has been included under Intangible Cultural Heritage of UNESCO. So in this discussion we shall see about Intangible Cultural Heritage. See, tangible means something which is perceptible by touch and has a physical presence. On other hand, intangible means unable to be touched or not having a physical presence. Intangible cultural heritage refers to heritage that is non-physical, but it is a living form of heritage. So it includes the oral traditions, performing arts, social practices, rituals, festival events, knowledge and practices concerning nature, etc. But these cultural heritage face threat. For example, the tangible heritage like monuments can be damaged and in case of intangible cultural heritage, they are lost or forgotten by the society. So UNESCO identifies, preserves and protects these intangible cultural heritages. For preserving and protecting tangible heritage sites, UNESCO has a separate convention called Convention Concerning the Protection of World Cultural and Heritage. It is a 1972 convention. Similarly, for protecting intangible cultural heritage, UNESCO has 2003 convention called Convention for Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. This convention aims to safeguard a specific form of intangible heritage that is practices, representation, expression, knowledge or skills. Also note that the convention proposes five broad domains in which ICH is manifested. They are oral traditions and expressions which includes language as a vehicle of intangible cultural heritage. Next one is performing arts, social practices, rituals and festive events, knowledge and practices concerning nature and universe, traditional craftsmanship. So various ICH belonging to different communities are listed under these five domains. So this is about intangible cultural heritage of UNESCO. With this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. Recently a number of megalithic headstones were found at Nagaparamba which is near Mallapuram district of Kerala. The stones were spotted from a single site during a recent evacuation conducted by Kerala State Archaeology Department. Note that the hat stones are popularly called Topikallu in Malayalam. They are hemispherical laterite stones that were used as lids on burial wounds during the Mahalithic period. The archaeologist also found the ashes in the wound that were covered with the hat stones. In this discussion, we will learn some points about megalithic culture. First of all, know that the term megalith is a combination of two Greek words such as mega and lith. Here mega means large and lith means stone. So basically megalith means large stones. In earlier times, megalith served as memorial structures and physical markers. 
the megaliths were placed above burial site of dead person to mark the place of burial this practice is what is termed as megalithic culture that is the culture of placing large stones on burial site is called megalithic culture this megalithic culture spread across the indian subcontinent but most of them are found in peninsular india they are mainly concentrated in the states of maharashtra karnataka tamil nadu kerala and telangana now talking about the types of megalith see there are five major types of megalith found in india first one is stone circles stone circles refer to large standing stones they are arranged in a circle or in the form of eclipse around a burial site the second one is dolmens dolmen is a type of megalith and it is a rectangular box like chamber placed above the burial site the third type is cist burial cist is shaped like a coffin and it was used as enclosure for dead bodies the fourth one is pit burial the pit burials contain the mortal remains of one or more human beings here the mortal remains of humans are buried with variety of surface stones in conical form the final one is menhir menhir refers to a single large long stones that are placed upright above the burial site so these are the major types of megalith with this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic unesco has added hoysala temples of karnataka to the world heritage list the hoysala temples are in belur halibedu somanadapura in karnataka this makes them 42nd unesco world heritage site of india shantini ketan a town in west bengal has also been added to unesco world heritage site The other UNESCO World Heritage Site in Karnataka include Hampi and Pattadakal. So in this discussion, let us learn about the Hoysala temples. We are going to learn about Chennakeshwa Temple in Belur, Hoysaleshwara Temple in Halibedu, Keshava Temple in Somanathapura, and some key facts about Hoysala architecture. Firstly, about Chennakeshwa Temple in Belur. It was built by Hoysala King Vishnu Vardhana to commemorate his victory over Cholas in 1116 AD. Belur is situated on the banks of Yagachi River and was one of the capitals of Hoysala Empire. It is a star-shaped temple and it is dedicated to Lord Vishnu and it is the main temple complex in Belur. Next about Hoysaleshwara Temple in Halibedu. It is the largest Shiva temple built by Hoysalas. The sculptures depict various aspects of Shiva as well as the scenes from Ramayana, Mahabharata and Bhagavata Purana. Halibedu has a walled complex containing three Jain temples. and it also has a stepped well so this is about hoysaleshwara temple next about keshava temple of somanadapura this temple is dedicated to lord krishna the hoysala temples were generally built during 12th century and 13th centuries the key elements of hoysala architecture are mandapa vimana and sculptures the hoysala architecture is known for its distinctive blend of bhumija style prevalent in central india nagara traditions of northern and western india and karnataka dravida models favored by kalyani chalukyas so hoysala architecture is basically blend of all these types of architecture these temples are mostly made out of soap stone which is relatively soft stone this is because the artists were able to carve their sculptures intricately with this type of soft stones Hoysalas were fiduciaries of Western Chalukya Empire. The important rulers were Vishnuvardhana, Veera Ballala II, Veera Ballala III. Vishnuvardhana was the greatest king of Hoysala dynasty. They created their kingdom around Halibedu in 1060 AD. Their territory spanned from Karnataka to Tamil Nadu over 3 centuries. Hoysala dynasty was a tolerant and pluralistic society. and they patronized various religions including Hinduism, Jainism and Buddhism. So this is about Hoysala architecture and Hoysala empire. With this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. Recently the Indore bench of Madhya Pradesh High Court has ordered Archaeological Survey of India to conduct a scientific survey of Bhojshala temple in Dhar district. This is to clarify its original nature. The Bhojshala temple was originally a temple of goddess Saraswati built by Paravara king Bhoja in 11th century AD. Kamal Maula Mosque complex was also present inside the Bhojshala temple. The mosque is built using structural remains of the temple. King Bhoja was a noted patron of art and architecture and he is said to have established a new school of architecture called Bhojshala. The monuments in Bhojshala also has slabs inscribed with Sanskrit and Prakrit literary works. Under an agreement with Archaeological Survey of India, Hindus perform puja in the temple every Tuesday and Muslims offer namaz every Friday. So this is a disputed temple complex 
which has both a temple and mosque. The controversy revolves around the original status of the site as a temple. The court noted that temple's character remains mysterious until determined. All the parties agree on the need to clarify the monument's nature and their task is assigned to Archaeological Survey of India under Monuments Act 1958. Now let us see some key facts about Raja Bhoj. Bhoja was Pratihara dynasty's greatest empire and actual founder of the empire. Gujara Pratiharas came to prominence in second quarter of 8th century when they offered successful resistance to Arabs. Pratiharas were in tripartite struggle with the Palas and Rashtrakutas over the dominance in Kanuj. King Bhoja defeated Pala King Devapala and he also defeated Rashtrakuta King Amogavarsha. So he established Gujara Pratiharas as a dominant power in northern India. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. Recently, a 21 meter long ship which is constructed using ancient stitched shipbuilding method which is called Tankai method is set to embark on a voyage from Odisha to Bali in Indonesia. This project not only showcases India's maritime tradition but also sheds light on its seafaring history. This initiative is in harmony with the Ministry of Culture's Project Mausam. This Project Mausam seeks to re-establish maritime cultural ties and foster cultural understanding among 39 countries bordering Indian Ocean. So here an important point to note that Tankai method is an ancient shipbuilding method. Now let us see the current status of maritime transport in India. See, India is 16th largest maritime country in the world. The maritime transport in India handles 95% of country's trade by volume and 68% by value. India is one of the world's top 5 ship recycling countries. India also owns over 30% global market share in ship breaking industry and the largest ship breaking facility in the world is present at Alang in Gujarat. Recently, Union Minister of Ports, Shipping and Waterways reviewed the project process of National Maritime Heritage Complex in Lothal. National Maritime Heritage Complex is being constructed at historic Indus Valley Civilization region of Lothal in Gujarat. This National Maritime Heritage Complex is said to become world's largest maritime museum complex and it will be an international tourist destination. The primary objective is to showcase the maritime heritage of India from ancient to modern times and it will be located in Lothal in the oldest port city of India. This project is a part of Sagar Mala program and is being developed with the participation of public and private institutes. We all know Lothal is a part of Indus Valley Civilization and it is one of the southernmost sites of Indus Valley Civilization. It flourished as trade center around 2200 BC and it has trade connections reaching West Asia and Africa. It is known for trade in beads, gems and ornaments. So this site of Lothal is the only port town in Indus Valley Civilization. Also note that Lothal was nominated for inclusion in UNESCO World Heritage Site and the application is still pending. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. Recently, Odisha governor has backed the entry of foreign nationals inside the world famous Jagannath temple in Puri. So this has created controversial debates. Currently, only Hindus are allowed inside the shrine to offer prayers to the deities in the Sanctum Sanctorum. A sign at the Lion's Gate, that is, at the main entrance of the temple, clearly states only Hindus are allowed inside the temple. So this is a serious ongoing debate. In this context, let us learn about the Jagannath temple. The temple is believed to have been constructed in 12th century by King Anantavarman of Eastern Ganga dynasty. Jagannath Puri temple is also called Yamanika Tirtha. This temple is also called as White Pagoda and it is part of Chardam pilgrimage. The Chardam pilgrimage sites were Badrinath, Dwaraka, Puri and Rameshwaram. This temple is known for its unique architecture which includes a massive compound wall and a large temple complex with multiple towers, halls and shrines. So the other popular monuments of Odisha are Konark Sun Temple which is also UNESCO World Heritage Site, Lingaraja Temple and Tara Tarini Temple. So with this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. We have already seen Hoysala Temple architecture is included in UNESCO World Heritage Site before that, Shanti Niketan was also included under UNESCO World Heritage Site. Now let us learn some points about Shanti Niketan. It is recognized by UNESCO as India's 41st World Heritage Site. It is present in Birbam district of West Bengal. In 1862, Rabindranath Tagore's father, Devendranath Tagore, spotted this landscape and decided to establish an ashram. 
So he built a large house called Shantiniketan, meaning abode of peace. The area originally called Bhubadanga was renamed Shantiniketan by Devendranath Tagore due to its conducive environment for meditation. In 1901, Rabindranath Tagore chose a significant portion of land and established a school based on Brahmachari Ashram model. This school later evolved into Vishwabharati University. So this is about Shantiniketan. In this context, we should also know some facts about Rabindranath Tagore. His literary works include The Home and the World, Geetanjali, Gora, Manasi, Balaka, Sonar Tori, Kabuli Wala. So these are the literary works of Rabindranath Tagore. He is also remembered for his song Ekla Chalore. He wrote two national anthems for two countries, for India and Bangladesh. Rabindranath Tagore was awarded with a knighthood for services to literature by King George V in 1915 and he renounced his knighthood after 1919 Jallianwala Bagh massacre his philosophy emphasized the importance of humanism spirituality and connection between nature and humanity these are the unesco world heritage sites of india take a look at it with this we have come to the end of the discussion if you like the video please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ai's academy youtube channel thank you